Let us pray. Creator God, inspire us now to reflect on the words of the gospel of your son, Jesus. And in reflecting on them, help us to deepen our knowledge of his way and help us to deepen our love for him and for you. We ask this in Jesus' name and through the power of the Spirit, with you there, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Time. One of the things that I don't understand, one of the many things I might add, is the theory of relativity. Now, Einstein cooked it up in the earlier, earliest parts of the 20th century. And essentially, what he, what he was onto, and I think while it's batty is right, that, that time is relative. That time can mean different things or take a, a different form depending on some of the other variables that exist within the dimensions in which we live. And Einstein talked about it in terms of a train. Train's moving, the time is going faster for a person watching the tra train than the person in the train, or vice versa. I forget which one it was. So it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but, but, but the notion that time is relative, that time can mean different things for different folks in different situations, that makes abundant sense. I remember a little poem, I, 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 uh, it was not a poem, but a saying that I heard years ago, time is too, too slow for the young and too fast for the old, but for those who love, time is not. Maybe a more poetic way of saying what Einstein was trying to get at. And the reading today, the gospel reading, though brief, is about time. It's about a lot of other things too, but it's about time. We're, we're right at the beginning of Mark's gospel. This is the way he starts out. And we hear right off the bat that in that time, Jesus appeared at the Jordan to be baptized by John. And right there in the beginning, what does he mean in that time? In that time is, is Mark's way of saying that this is the time of fulfillment. The prophets, the prophets have said that in those days, great things will happen. In those days, Israel will be restored. In those days, the people will again find true worship with their God. And in those prophecies, you find them in, in Jeremiah, you find them in Joel, you find them in Isaiah. And in those prophecies, the prophet is pointing forward to something that is coming. And now Mark is saying the time has arrived. The one who is expected has come. And now God is moving powerfully, powerfully among his people. And you see in Mark a sense of urgency. Jesus comes to be baptized by the, in the Jordan by John. And as he comes out of the water, Mark says, immediately, immediately the spirit descends like a dove after the heavens have been ripped open. And the word in Greek for, for, for ripped open, it's not like a gentle little tear. We're talking about a powerful, forceful, destructive wrenching of the heavens. Because Mark is saying that the prayer of Isaiah is being fulfilled. Would that you would tear open the heavens, he prays in Isaiah 60, I think it's 4 and come down to dwell with us. Then, then our enemies would see that we have a God. Then we would be saved. Then we would be restored. Now that time is here. And God is moving powerfully and immediately among his people. And what is he doing? He is revealing to us in this passage 
that it is nothing less than the fulfillment of Isaiah's prayer. He has come down from heaven. As the Spirit descends into Christ. Into him, not on him, into him. Jesus and the Spirit are one. The Father speaks. We see the entire Trinity here. And he said, this is my Son. In you I am well pleased. And Jesus knows as a human being now what he has always been from his incarnation. He is the Son of God walking among God's people. He is the one who will save all of us from everything that afflicts us. And so, again, with this language of urgency, <clears throat> the Spirit throws, literally, Jesus into the wilderness. The wilderness? Why the wilderness? What a lousy place to be. Except the wilderness is a place of, of hostility and danger and darkness and fear. Hostility is a place where, where life is threatened constantly, but hostility for the Jews was a place where they were tried over and over again for 40 days, for 40 years. While they left Egypt and, and wandered, wandered and wandered to the promised land. And they were tested and so often failed. They were tempted and succumbed to temptation. And now Jesus is in that wilderness. And there are wild beasts and dangers. But what do we hear except that Jesus was with the wild beasts because where Jesus goes, God's peace is present. Where Jesus goes, there is shalom. Isaiah says, in those days, the lion will lie down with the lamb. There will be peace in God's kingdom. And for just this moment in Jesus' ministry, the wild animals lay down with him. And the angels minister to him. And we know that the new Israel has not succumbed to temptation. We know that Jesus has begun the war with evil that will reach its culmination on Calvary. We know that now as Jesus comes out of the wilderness to start his ministry, he will be walking the highway of shalom that God has intended and prepared for all times. Jesus will touch the blind and they will see. Jesus will touch the lepers and they'll be cleansed. Jesus will, will, will cure the paralytics and they'll walk. Jesus will cast out the demons that afflict those who suffer so deeply from their, their compulsions and their addictions. Because where Jesus goes and what Jesus touches is always restored to peace. And after his trial in the wilderness, he comes and here is his message. The time, the time is here. There are a number of words in Greek that can be rendered as time. One of them is chronos. Chronos is the time that my watch tells. Chronos is the time that the calendar tells. Chronos is the time that goes minute after minute after minute after minute after minute. But there's another word for, for time, and it's kairos. And kairos means God's own time. It means grace-filled time. 
It means time of opportunity. It means the, the time that, that we can flourish and grow. It's not the time that we count and measure. It's the time in which we live and thrive. It's not too fast. It's not too slow. It abounds. It's the, it's the time of love, which is neither the time of age nor the time of youth. So he says, the time is here. What's the time for? Well, the time is here because, because God is finally fulfilling all his promises. Evil will, be, will perish. Death itself will die. When Jesus touches death, whether that death be Lazarus's death or his own, death cannot win. And it never could win again. Death in your life, death in my life, death in our loved ones' lives only has apparent victory because Jesus is the Lord of life and no one who believes in him, even if that person dies, no one who dies believing in Christ will truly perish. They will have new and more profoundly beautiful life. So the time has come for all of that to happen. And what do we have to do? Jesus says, repent. Repent. We hear it so much. Uh, maybe it's better to look at the Greek word and unpack it a little bit because the word that Mark uses in the Greek is metanoia, metanoia. And, and it means to turn around. It means to have a different outlook. Now, interestingly, this, this command, repent, is not given to the, in the singular. It's given in the plural. Jesus is speaking to all of us. He doesn't want individuals to repent. He wants churches to repent. He wants communities to repent. He wants nations to repent. And if you don't think our nation needs repenting, then you haven't been reading the news if you haven't seen the hatred, you haven't been reading the news. If you don't know that the leading cause of death in America is abortion, you haven't been reading the news. And none of the hatred, none of the unnecessary death honors God. We desperately need to repent. We need to think differently. We need to not think as Democrats or Republicans. We need to not think as self-interested people. We need to think with the eyes and the heart and the mind of God. God loves every single life he calls into the world, born and not yet born. He loves people on the left. He loves people on the right. And he says to us, don't you dare hate them. Don't you dare lie about them. Don't you dare rejoice in their, in, in their misfortunes. These are your brothers and your sisters. Repent. Think differently. Don't think like, like humans think. Think like God thinks. Think with love in your heart. He says, repent, radically change your point of view. And then the second thing he says is, is trust. Well, it says believe, but, but the word believe we take to, too often to mean just assent to a bunch of doctrinal stuff, you know, believe a bunch of things. But really what Jesus is asking us to do is trust God. Trust is a whole different thing than, than just believing in someone. It, it, trust is, is confidence that, that, that God will be with us. Confidence that Jesus is Lord. Confidence that death has been defeated. Confidence that he walks with us 
every moment of our lives. So Lent starts in the wilderness. Lent starts in the wilderness and it invites us into the wilderness of our own lives. It invites us to go and look at where the places are in our hearts that God doesn't get to. It, it asks us to say, what are, what are our blind spots? Where are the things about us and what are the things about us that God would have us change? Because he wants us to be his holy people. He wants us to be different. He doesn't want us <clears throat> to be the, like the rest of them out there. He doesn't want us to be, be screaming to, 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 to render things rational. He wants us to make his kingdom come on earth. He wants his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for that every time we say the Lord's Prayer. But we have to take responsibility for it. If we're not doing his will on earth, who's gonna? We trust that God is with us in every one of those dark places. If you have an addiction and you're struggling with it, you're not struggling alone. If you're, if you're grieving a loved one and you're oppressed with grief, you're not alone in that grief. If you're, if you're brokenhearted because of a relationship, and you think that nobody in the world understands you, you're wrong because God is right with you and God understands you perfectly well and God loves you. And the whole na notion that Jesus asks of us, the whole, the whole response is to trust that. It's to trust that when we let Jesus into our lives, we are never alone again. He is with us. He will always be with us. And he will never, ever leave us. Ever. <clears throat> and so, what time is it in your life? Is it just... 11 o'clock? Is it just February the 21st? Or is it God's own opportune time? Is it the time when, when you can have a new birth of life? When all the darkness in your, in your heart can be, can be eliminated by the presence of the light? In that case, Jesus says, repent. Come back. Come back to the God who has never left you. And open your hearts through prayer, through penance, through fasting, through sacrifice. That's what Lent asks us for. <clears throat> Why that? Because all of those things, prayer, penance, fasting, sacrifice, put us in second place and allow God to be where God belongs out front. What time is it? It is God's time. It is, it is God's grace-filled time. And it is our opportunity to make the most of that time to grow deeply in love again with God. Amen.